Let's play this game of yours. What's up, YouTube? This is Debbie, aka Deviant Dreamers, and I'm here today to teach you how to become a Gwent master. Now, today we're looking specifically at Gwent in The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. This is something to bear in mind because Gwent Online is very, very different, and I'll be going over that in a later video. Should we start by reviewing the fundamentals or go right to free training? Even skilled masters need to hone the fundamentals. Now we'll be starting with the extreme basics of Gwent, so if you find yourself a complete newbie to the game, you don't understand anything about it, this section of the video will be for you. If you understand some of the basics, but kind of want to improve your skill or your understanding, feel free to skip through the video as needed with the chapters that I have titled for you. Fine. Additionally, if you have any other questions that are not answered in this video, feel free to leave those questions in the comments below and I'll do my best to address them in a future video. Care for a round of Gwent? I'm always in the mood for Gwent. When you first play Gwent, you might notice that there are four different factions, or essentially decks, that you might be able to play. There is the Skoya Tail, or the Elven deck, the Nilfgaardian Empire, the Monsters, and, of course, the Northern Realms. Most of us tend to start out with the Northern Realms in the beginning of the game because we do have the most cards that we can play with at the very start. But, of course, you can strengthen your numbers by defeating other opponents in Gwent or purchasing cards from local merchants. If you own the Witcher 3 Wild Hunt Blood and Wine expansion, you'll also notice that there is a new faction, the Skellige faction, that you can play with as well. On the left-hand side, you'll see all the cards that you can choose from in this particular faction that you own. On the right-hand side will be your current deck, and in the middle will be statistics about your deck, such as the total number of cards, number of unit cards, special cards, and strength overall. You can filter through several options as well to see what types of cards you might have, such as all cards, close combat cards, range cards, siege cards, special cards, hero cards, and more. You can also see what leader cards you have available. Every deck will have one leader card. Both you and your opponent can play this during the match. The leader card's special ability can only be activated one time during the entire game, so please keep that in mind. It's also important to note that each deck must have a minimum of 22 unit cards and a maximum of 10 special cards. You will not be able to proceed with a match unless you meet these basic requirements. Let's have a look at our cards, shall we? When looking at the cards in your deck, it's important to note at least three things about them. The first being the number at the very top left-hand corner of the card. This is the point value of the card. Of course, you want the most points in each round of Gwent to be able to win the entire game. The second thing to notice is the yellow circle that has one of three symbols on it. Either a close combat symbol, a range symbol, or a siege symbol. That means that this card can only be placed in the corresponding row. Some cards, for example from the Skoya Tail faction, can be played in either the combat or the range row. And lastly, some cards have a third circle on them, another white circle, that designates some sort of condition or bonus power that this card might have. For example, in the Northern Realms faction, poor fucking infantry doubles its power when played with another poor fucking infantry card. Kidwani Siege Expert also has a special power. This power is to add one point to every card played in the siege row. There are also some cards called Spy Cards, which are played on the opponent's side of the battlefield and give them that point value boost, however, they allow you to draw additional cards. Additionally, there are cards that allow you to resurrect a card from your graveyard and play it over again. When carefully considering what to put in your deck, my recommendation is to try and achieve a balance in things. You never know what your opponent is going to bring to you with their hand, so include a couple of weather-related cards, include a leader charge that you think is fairly powerful, and also make sure that you have a balance of close combat, range, and siege as much as possible. 
As you grow your card collection, it's definitely beneficial to make sure that you have strong hero cards or cards that might be able to be multiplier cards and bring in the strength of other units as well. Now what I'm going to do for you next is walk you through step by step my thought process as I play a couple of games for you. The first match will be from the very beginning of the game. The second match will be from the Blood and Wine expansion, so that I can show you a little bit more of what you might see in the future. Let's play! So in our first match in White Orchard, I was given the opportunity to go first. Now I have two cards, up to two cards in my hand that I can redraw. Looking through my hand, I had a clear weather card. Right off the bat, I decided to get rid of that because my leader card, my full test, had the ability to clear the weather already. Looking through the rest of my hand, I see some very strong cards in there. So I'm actually going to keep them all. Now it's my turn first, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to play one of my spy cards. I chose to do this first so that not only could I get a card advantage, but I'd also be able to see where my opponent was going with their own deck. My opponent decided to pass pretty early on, with five points on the board. Well, because I had a one card advantage, I decided to play a six point siege unit, so that I not only won the round, but kept our cards at an even place. The Northern Realm's ability also gave me an extra card at the end of my turn. Because my playstyle is very reactive, I like to see where my enemies are going first, I decided to play a Kidwani Siege Expert first, get a low scoring point on the board, something that could build up with more strength. I then reacted by placing another Siege card. That way I had an 8 point value versus their 2. As I kept playing cards, I decided let's stick out with the Siege for now, let's not use any range units at this point in time because that fog could aid me in the future, and I don't want to hurt my own units. I continued to play some siege cards to also draw out the fact and see if they had any torrential rains that would take all of my siege units down to a one point value. So again, I'm playing very reactively. I currently have about 36 points to the opponent's 20. I played a close combat card with Zoltan, again, to avoid the potential of fog harming my own cards. Now, although I did not have a second Blue Stripes Commando to make sure that I doubled that point value and got the maximum benefit, I wanted to keep drawing out their cards to see if I could win on this 2-0 round. And you know what? There definitely was a 20 point advantage that I had on the opponent with an extra card in my hand. So I thought it was definitely worth it. I played the Impenetrable Fog card just to test out the waters and see if they had any other strong cards that I might have to compete with to save my last archer for the third and possible round. However, we ended up winning anyways with a two and oh. And just like that, we've won our first round of Gwent! Congratulations! You're on the way to becoming a pro in no time. Well, you're a quick study. Quick, but mischievous. Now the next match that I played was held in Tucson, in the Blood and Wine expansion of The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. Care for a round of Gwent? In this particular deck, I have cards with special abilities, such as spy cards, a scorch card that kills the highest powered unit on the battlefield, and additionally, a lot of my monster faction cards, which have the muster ability, allowing me to summon any card with the same name from my hand or deck. My opponent got to go first. They're playing the Skellige faction and put forward a bovine. I decided to play a spy card to get that initial card advantage and kind of tease out where they were going with their play style. They decided to play Dandelion, who is supposed to double the strength of all close combat units on that row, which didn't quite make sense to me yet, but it was okay. I decided to play one of my Arrakis units in the Siege category, which would summon all the rest of my Arrakises from my deck as well. And they responded by doing something very, very similar. So we ended up kind of playing back and forth with our cards that had this muster ability and were able to pull forward a large number of units from our hand and our deck. 
Now, I did already have a massive advantage from a 35 to a 14, plus, if you notice, a two card advantage as well on the left hand side of the screen. So this round was a very, very easy win for me. Both of us still had not used our leader abilities as well, so I decided to pass. Both of us also had a card remaining on the battlefield. Mine because of the monster faction ability, and my opponents because the bovine had transformed into a chort by the end of the round. They decided to play a commander's horn to double their strength in the close combat row, and I continued to play cards that I thought would give me a little bit of a boost in close combat as well. Now they played rather passively, they played a berserker, which would need a mardrome to be able to transform it into a bear. So I decided to go again for that massive transformation of playing Dandelion and doubling the score of several of my cards on the close combat row. By scorching his short, I was able to take a massive lead yet again in round two, 49 to eight. And because the opponent had passed in this round, there was no possibility that they were going to be able to win to push us to a third round. So why not? Rub salt in the wound a little bit there. Why not? That's my boy. I hope this video was able to better explain for you some of the basics of Gwent, as well as some of the strategy and the thought process behind it. If you have any additional questions, again, please do let us know in the comments below this YouTube video. I also will have some videos up for Gwent Online as well if you're interested in that very shortly. Thanks so much for watching, I greatly appreciate your time, and make sure to subscribe for more Witcher 3 and Gwent content. Thanks for everything. Don't mention it. Hope to see you again very, very soon.